Today's talk is an attempt to encourage you to think about the relationship between social difference in all its variety, including class, and agrarian change, and in particular, ask the difficult and often unasked question about how such dynamics are different in pastoral settings compared to settled agriculture. So, if we look at the historical literature on pastoralism, going back to the colonial era, and the middle picture there is none other than Evans Pritchard sitting amongst the Azande um, in the 1930s or 40s. Um, the conventional views of pastoralism coming from this tradition of structural functionalist, colonial anthropology, and to some extent replicated today by some of the sort of popular exoticism that comes out of popular renditions around pastoralism, sometimes uh, from NGOs and others, is that you know, pastoralism is a coherent, egalitarian, tribal-based system, cast in terms of traditional, subsistence, culture-bound, you know, remember the, the notion of the cattle complex from Herskovitz way back. Um, and that they're not market oriented, price responsive and all the rest of that. Now, we know that that's not the case, but the narrative, as we've discussed before in this series, is that pastoralists have a particular characteristic and are different from modern capitalist um, ranchers or farmers. So the development aim is to transfer, uh, transform one backward system to the other modern system. Now, we know that that's not the case, but the inheritance of that style of thinking from the colonial era um, right through to popular presentations of the present is very deeply embedded. But we all know that, high, that uh, pastoral societies are highly differentiated, of course. And indeed, Karl Marx suggested they were the original capitalists. In Capital, he, turned, he, he said, were the term capital to be applica applicable to classical antiquity, then the nomadic hordes with their flocks on the steppes of Central Asia would be the greatest capitalists, for the original meaning of, wor of the word capital is cattle. So it's not as if capitalism and livestock production are, have been separated, it's just very often there's a misconception of the character of livestock production in pastoral settings, I think. Um, but that actually in practice, many features of classic capital, capitalist production um, are evident. Um, when one looks at pastoralists and ranchers in different parts of the world, one can see many commonalities more than differences. And in fact, if you go back to some of the earlier literature on pastoralism, I'm thinking of Harold Schneider, for example, who said the pastoralist is not very different from the business speculator in America. Or Walter Goldschmidt, who in African context made the argument that um, exchange was completely central to pastoral societies, whether through livestock markets, bride wealth, and so on. But actually, a lot of that literature didn't dig into what social difference meant. And on this slide, there are a number of examples of literatures that have emerged over the years that have emphasized social difference. There is a literature on gender. Um, and Dorothy Hodgson's book, I think, is on, on, for the African context, is one of the best, which looks at the patterns of, of gender relations in pastoral societies. And it's not always this simple characterization of patriarchy. There is room for ba bargaining, negotiation, and autonomy. But a lot of the literature, particularly out of the development agencies and the NGOs, focuses on women rather than gender, uh, and doesn't get into the relational question of how gender relations are constructed. And this, to some extent, is, is also the case in the growing literature in past on pastoralism around age and generation. There is a category of youth constructed, not necessarily trying to understand young people in relation to uh, other age groups. There is much more and a growing literature on wealth differences in pastoral societies. We've talked about this in other sessions. 
Uh, this book, The Poor Are Not Us, is a, was a useful book by Brock Dew and Anderson uh, way back now, thinking about how poverty is understood and how destitution is addressed in different pastoral societies, being quite different um, processes of people moving out of pastoral societies uh, when they're extremely poor to towns or urban proletarian lifestyles, or being incorporated into pastoral societies through uh, exploitative re relations of slavery, more or less, in other settings. And of course we see, and we'll come back to this, there are new relationships of ownership, both of land and livestock, as new migrant relationships, as discussed in another session, um, are struck. So there are new forms of pastoralism which require us to think in very different ways to the old colonial anthropologists. So, where do we take our um, ideas from? Two dead white men, potentially as a starting point, to think about where does a critical agrarian political economy come from? Now, there's been a huge amount of debate about this over many, many years in agrarian political economy. Karl Marx... Uh, Vladimir Lenin, Lenin, the debates between Kautsky and Luxembourg, between Lenin and Chayanov, going way back um, in, through the uh, late 19th and into the 20th century, looking at patterns of differentiation and so on. So for agrarian political economy, largely focusing, as I'll keep stressing, on settled agrarian uh, contexts, there, there are three key elements, to put it simply, grossly simply. Production, accumulation, and politics. And it's the interaction between production, accumulation, and politics that makes an understanding of political economy uh, central. Now, I can't go into the long and elaborate debates of uh, agrarian political economy. You'll have to read the uh, back issues of the Journal of Peasant Studies and so on, which go back to the early 1970s. Uh, and even before that, there were the big debates in Africa, in Tanzania, and Kenya in particular, about what the agrarian question meant. It was essentially, and I'm caricaturing massively here, an attack on what some have defined uh, as agrarian populism, a failure to understand class as the central feature of uh, how both agrarian societies uh, exist within uh, class relations and how post-colonial states in particular are constructed out of that. But there's a lot of critique of all of this debate which came out of classic studies in Russia and elsewhere that it was too structural, it was too deterministic, it subsumed gender and other social differences under class and it didn't take account of peasant agency um, there has been a recent issue of the Journal of Peasant Studies, in fact last year, to commemorate the 200th anniversary of Karl Marx's birth, which I think brings us up to date with agrarian Marxism. But not one single paper in that issue, uh, good as they are, address issues of pastoral settings. So the basic argument is that class, as influenced by gender, generation, ethnicity, and other ax axes of difference, is key to understanding uh, both production and accumulation and politics. And this little book, Class Dynamics of Agrarian Change, by Henry Bernstein, one of the foremost scholars in this field, is a very useful primer. It's the first book in the Small Books for Big Ideas series on peasant studies, I think is an exemplary uh, approach to try and understand these bigger issues. And of course there are other sources for this. I've mentioned the Journal of Peasant Studies, the Journal of Agrarian Change, Agrarian South, uh, another important journal, all debating these questions. And indeed there's been a revival of debate about critical agrarian studies in the wake of neoliberalized globalization, land grabbing and so on in the last decade or so. But still, not a lot about pastoralism. <laughs>
where can we take the directions from this debate? Again, I have no time to cover it all. A good pointer to that, of course, is Bernstein's book. I would point you to um, a number of papers in Agrarian South by Sam Moyo, Pravin Jha, Paris Yeros and others. And there's a very nice pair of papers written in 2010 by Harun Akram Lodi and Chris Kay, uh, who give an overview of, of what does critical agrarian economy, political economy, mean. Key starting point in, in giving you a few directions where to go and indeed where to stop. Historical analysis, absolutely central to try and understand the emergence of agrarian capitalism and there's a huge debate led by Terry Byers and many others on the different paths of capitalism in agrarian societies. And central to this was the transformation of peasants into wage labour and hence labour power through processes of dispossession. Key concept, central to all of that historical analysis. And it happened in different places in different ways. The Prussian path, the American path, the European path and so on. But to understand this, you really have to dig into what might be called the micro-political economy of commodification, of land, of labour, production, through restructuring labour processes. And through that, shifts of the technical basis of production, and crucially leading to class differentiation of the peasantry. So you move from production for use and household use and, and social reproduction to production for exchange and accumulation. Classic move towards capitalist production. And therefore, the drive of capital results in the separation of producers from the means of production. And through that, the processes of what Lenin called semi-proletarianization -proletari and the creation of a stratified class in the classes in the peasantry he he talked about um, middle middle peasants uh, rich peasants and poorer peasants and so through the development of capitalism agrarian surplus accumulation by some people can be used to support structural transformation in the economy towards industrialization and the emergence of a capitalist society both within agriculture and beyond but of course, these processes are heavily conditioned by the class forces and their effect on political processes. The key point there about politics. So agrarian, the agrarian question is, is fundamentally about where this occurs, why this occurs, and the implication for the processes of accumulation and social change associated with the emergence of capital. So is this classic agrarian question <coughs> which I've summarised grossly, briefly, uh, still relevant. Uh, Haroon and Chris say, yes, it is, and why? First, the continued importance of smallholder food production to rural livelihoods. Second, the deepening of the market imperative and the law of value across the world in the capitalist economy, and including its spread to nature under neoliberalism. And thirdly, Processes of agrarian change significant, and the significance of class in processes of what's happening in ex-socialist ex settings, re-peasantisation, de-collectivisation and so on, still absolutely permanent, uh, uh, pertinent to our understanding. The question for us, though, is does all this apply to pastoralism? My argument is yes, but in particular ways that it's worth us thinking about. A central idea in agrarian studies is the notion of petty commodity production. This unstable category, based on the fact that producers are both at the same time capitalists, exchanging for the market, employing workers, and also workers on their own, and peasants on their own, uh, uh, producing for them themselves. So they're both workers and capitalists, peasants and, um, and involved in exchange production. So various people, Gibbon, Neocosmos, Patnaik, Shivji, Mamdani, many, many, many others who've thought about agrarian change have focused in on, on the notion of petty commodity production and the different dynamics of accumulation. 
particularly accumulation from below as against Marx's version of primitive c- accumulation, which was just dispossession and extraction. And contrasting accumulation from below with accumulation from above, or, or what other people call extended accumulation. And these differences are, are significant in understanding who gets what and, and where it goes. So, in Lenin's analysis of the Russian peasantry, after land reform, he argued that participation in commodity production means that the middle peasantry, as I mentioned before, divides into a rich peasantry that employs wage workers and a poor peasantry that must do wage work. And the poor face what others have called a reproductive squeeze, the basic inability to survive through farming. So, in a way, the poor peasants are very similar to labourers and in fact many poor peasants also have to do labouring work and this is what Henry Bernstein calls the emergence of what he calls the labour question and the emergence of what he calls fragmented classes of labour these are the footloose labourers dash peasants who are reliant on very diversified uh, forms of livelihood they're neither farmers nor traders nor Uh, wage workers, but combinations of all of them. So the notion of classes of labour then becomes important. But of course these poor classes of labour are not without power. Um, The arguments of Scott in Weapons of the Weak and the broader questions around moral economy is that people can mobilise. And indeed commodification processes are not complete. There are all sorts of hybrid arrangements where things are marketized but not marketized. So the question for us then is, are pastoralists often actually petty commodity producers? Can we think about them in this way and think about patterns of accumulation and production in the same way that agrarian studies have done? I think yes. Great flexibility of different class positions, processes of accumulation from above and from below in pastoral economies. But there are some peculiarities and particularities in pastoral systems that I think we should explore. First, I'm going to just mention a case study. How do you go about exploring differentiation and accumulation? I'll give you an example from my own work with others in Zimbabwe. Because it's actually quite difficult. The standard snapshot survey that the agricultural economists will do will tell you how many, how many assets people have, but not how they change over time. So this does require uh, a certain amount of longitudinal questions. So we start very much with looking at how production, labour, social re- reproduction and exchange happens through some longitudinal surveys. So essentially a description, a livelihoods analysis, classic. Then we look at how that changes. We ask who's stepping up, hanging in, dropping out, to use a terminology from Andrew Dorwood and others. In other words, who's accumulating and who's not, and why. And then we ask, well, what are the structural features of all of this? What shapes this dynamic? Is it class, is it gender, is it age, or is it combinations of all three? So methodologically it's quite complicated, but it's different to classic uh, single snapshot livelihoods analysis if we're really going to get a sense of how these things change over time. Anyway, I won't go into the details of this. This is the results of our analysis. And we came up with all of these different types of livelihood, characterization of livelihoods associated with different dynamics of accumulation and different class positions. You can read the whole story in a paper that we did in Journal of Agrarian Change some while back. But what are the implications of this for the Zimbabwe setting? An agrarian setting, of course, with lots of livestock there, but a settled agrarian setting. There was an emergence of petty commodity producers accumulating from below. After land reform, these were the drivers of a new economy. But there was also elite capture, accumulation from above. There was also those who were hanging in or had left the system. And there was a lot of gender and age dynamics both within and between households that um, affected what was going on. And all of this resulted in, as a result of these new accumulation dynamics, of a new type of politics in the countryside. So linking production, 
accumulation politics again, a political economy analysis. Henry Bernstein came up with four key questions for agrarian political economy, um, which for somebody who's so erudite and, and well-read, sound, they sound a bit simplistic, but in embedded in them are some really important insights from agrarian political economy. These are the four questions. So who owns what or who has access to what, what is really key in thinking about property, ownership of assets and resources. So for us, thinking about livestock and pastoralism, we're thinking about livestock, we're thinking about land, we're thinking about fodder, we're thinking about water. And it may be different people um, moving between places and in different places that these property relations are constructed. So again, different to uh, agrarian setting, settled agrarian setting. Who does what? This relates to the social divisions of labour, the distinctions between those who are employed, unemployed, um, employing, as well as divisions of labour based on gender and age. And here, for us thinking about pastoralism, we're thinking about herding labour, especially where non-family absentee owners are involved, um, and so on. Very particular relations. Who gets what? This relates, relates to income and assets and the patterns of accumulation over time. And so these processes of social differentiation that I've been talking about. And this is clearly uh, increasing, as all the data shows in pastoral societies, and highly gender and age specific. And what do they do with it is the fourth question. This relates to the whole array of, of livelihood strategies and their consequences for consumption, social reproduction, savings, investment, and so on. And the question of, of reproduction squeezes, accumulation from above and below, highly relevant again to pastoral settings. So returning now to uh, a little comment on method. Very often people assume that political economy is all about a very deterministic structuralist analysis of historical processes, which some of it is. But actually, if you look back again to Karl Marx uh, and his original, one of his earlier analyses and reflections on method in political economy in the introduction to the Grundrisse, which was originally written in 1858, but only published much later, he argues that a critical political economy approach must expose what he calls the rich totality of many determinations and relations, in other words, a detailed livelihoods analysis, and help expose what he calls the concrete uh, understanding that emerges from the conceptual abstractions and, and these detailed empirical observation. And this, he argues, avoids the danger of what he would call a chaotic conception of the whole, the endless description of particularity without trying to understand what's, what's the underlying process. So in other words, what he's arguing, and these are my terms, he's arguing for the combination of a livelihoods analysis with a, a structural um, class social difference, political economy analysis, and that you need to combine the two. So if that's been the tradition slightly lost in certain strands of political economy, it's worth reclaiming, because I think it is revealing of a lot of themes that are relevant to pastoralism. So back to pastoralism. What are some of the particularities that help us think about what's different about pastoralism compared to all of that literature in agrarian political economy that's largely focused on settled agriculture in different parts of the world? Um, first, the terms on the slide are classic terms in agrarian political economy, but let's think about what they mean in pastoral settings. First is the notion of capital or wealth, the commodity character of what's being produced and unlike crops which are most well not all but some are annual they're not mobile livestock are different they give interest they grow they're a store of wealth 
as well as store uh, as as well as producers. Tim Ingold's got a nice quote in his Reindeer Economies book from way back, um, where he reflects that the Latin word for money, pecus, refers referred equally to a herd of domestic livestock, while the Greek word for interest on a financial loan, tekos, and my pronunciation of Greek and Latin are pretty rubbish, denoted also the progeny of an animal. So again, rooted very much in pastoral economies, uh, interest, basic ideas of interest and money um, uh, from long back. A lot of the development and policy debate is on markets and commodification and and perhaps less on wealth and capital um, but of course there's a nice paper by Matt Turner in Geoforum some years ago which reflects on, on from the West African case how um, wealth in livestock is really significant these are mobile banks of wealth producing interest so that's different to cropping, the notion of capital and wealth. The notion of commodification and markets is also slightly different. There's a, in the same issue that Matt's paper is in, um, the, uh, the overview and the title of the issue in Geoforum is called Livestock as a Troublesome Commodity. And it highlights in particular that relationship between cattle, um, particularly cattle, and capitalism and makes the argument that particularly under neoliberalism we need to think about livestock a bit more um, often forgotten in our studies of, uh, of agrarian societies because there are particular dynamics of production and accumulation that are significant in livestock producing settings now going way back to an early paper on the amazon by susanna hecht you know the the emergence of, of ranching systems in brazil and elsewhere have been been well studied but I think some of the dynamics and some of the implications of those sort of classic ranching studies from the 80s and so on, the emergence of the cattle economy in the, on the fringes of the Amazon, are becoming more and more relevant in other pastoral areas. Um, and thinking about the way that um, commodification uh, of the livestock system affects. But of course, it's not just livestock as the commodity. There are different elements along a value chain that are commodified, which means that value um, of livestock is different for different people. Uh, third point here is, of course, the intimate relationship between livestock and environment, a theme we've discussed a number of times in these talks. But, of course, as, as a number of books and papers and so on have, have mentioned over the last period, the industrialization of livestock systems are, is creating a particular imprint on, um, on environmental uh, settings. And again, this is not classic uh, traditional pastoralism, but the process of commodification, of increasing use of external feeds, of the s links to the soy economy, all of that is having, having an impact. Tony Weiss produced a very nice book called The Ecological Hoofprint, which I thought was nice on the global burden of industrial livestock. And we can think of work by Mindy Schneider and many others on, on this sort of theme, who may or may not draw on Marx's concept of the metabolic rift and so on. Moving swiftly on, labor regimes, um, another thing that is obviously affecting the way livestock production and pastoralism is operating. We talked about this already the uh, separation of ownership and management. Absentee owners, laborers as management um, can have huge implications on how the system is operating. Very pastoral, pastoral specific, um, but has increasingly increased importance uh, if livestock as a form of capital and wealth and source of investment for outsiders is being used on the range and employing labor to maintain that source of wealth. Uh, if your bank is mobile and relying on, uh, on rangelands, then you have to have a very different relationship to that bank than going down to the high street and putting your check in. So that has implications. And mobility in territory, a theme that we, we talked about already, um, what happens when capital moves? 
Um, it's difficult to control, taxation questions and so on, cross-border questions, but it's very key if property, uh, if land is fixed and your other form of uh, capital moves, then that relationship between mobility and uh, the emergence of capitalism becomes crucial. And finally, the notions of exchange and identity. Who we are as pastoralists um, affects how people think about markets. There's a lovely book on the Nua by Sharon Hutchinson, Sudan, um, who looks at the historical evolution of markets in that setting and argues that actually as markets have become more and more linked in to wider networks of exchange, there are different spheres of exchange that evolve. Markets for animals, markets for bride wealth, markets for other uh, sources. And that affects the way that the relationship between identity, markets, exchange, value, central questions in agrarian political economy, but very particular to livestock setting. So I think all of those six themes um, are relevant to core debates in agrarian political economy going way back, but actually are different in uh, pastoral settings in important ways and in ways that the literature has only fragmentarily uh, explored. So we've talked mostly about production and accumulation, those two Core, two of the three core elements of agrarian political economy. What about politics? How does this all relate to politics? Well, not surprisingly, quite fundamentally. But again, when we think about agrarian politics, the bias towards settled agriculture and the implications for pastoralism um, is a bit, uh, is replicated again. So, there's a lot of literature, and again, I can't do justice to it in one slide, on how peasants mobilize and how peasant struggles create the momentum for political change. Um, Eric Wolf's classic book um, looked at Russia, China, Vietnam, Mexico, Algeria, Cuba, um, amongst others, peasant struggles in the, in the uh, 20th century that resulted in significant political change in each of those settings. Um, one could add on uh, recent uh, processes of change in, in Zimbabwe and Colombia and various other places where similar dynamics, well not similar, but, uh, but peasant-driven dynamics have affected um, agrarian change. But a lot of that focus of all of that debate um, which, as mentioned earlier, I've been involved in, in, in the Zimbabwean context, is focus on land, settled agriculture, and land reform. So what about broader questions? Um, we'll come back to that in a second. So a lot of this has helped us think about agrarian social movements. A couple of books there, um, another in the uh, small book series, uh, this time by Mark Edelman and uh, Jun Boras, and a, uh, and a special issue of Journal of Agrarian Change, which was also produced as a book. And attempts, basic attempts to try and understand what, does, what do agrarian social movements mean, where do they come from, what are the politics behind them. But I would say in critique of that, where has been the, the focus on mobile um, rural um, peoples in these processes? Now, of course, thinking about agrarian movements, agrarian politics, you know, everyone says are ah, relational, it depends who you are, where you are, you know, all these studies of past agrarian struggles have, have highlighted that. So it's less about thinking about autonomy, sovereignty and so on, but more about thinking about how those dynamics play out over time. And so the relationship between peasants and workers and consumers and people living in town and so on. And that's sometimes forgotten. Um, now, of course, there have been big, there are big movements that have merged out of particular smallholder peasant struggles. Um, La Via Campesina is obviously the most prominent and the most well-known um, and is 
claimed to be the world's largest social movement. Um, impressive as it is, I wonder how much La Via Campesina thinks about pastoralists. Probably not a huge amount, in my experience. I wonder equally about whether the UN Declaration on the Rights of Peasants and Other People Working in Rural Areas uh, does too. Because who are the other people working in rural areas? It's slightly after the fact. Um, so not wanting to dismiss or undermine these very, very important struggles, um, there are necessarily limits to them. Um, because the imagery and the debate, just look at the imagery of the uh, La Via Campesina's own logo, uh, is very much about settled agriculture and an image of the smallholder farmer. So in pastoral settings, there have been quite a number of attempts to think about, well, how does the politics of mobilization, and particular around pastoralism, emerge um, around a common shared identity and political struggle? And there have been a number of these uh, pastoral gatherings convened by um, the Pastoral Communications Initiative, the World uh, WISP, the um, IUCN-led uh, pastoralism network, and so on, which I think have been really important as, as foci for thinking about, well, what, what difference does pastoralism make? Um, and uh, I was lucky enough to attend one of the universities of the bush, um, an attempt to try and encourage thinking amongst intellectuals and pastoralists and NGO practitioners and donors and others on, in, in this particular case, on innovation. And it was a fantastic exchange. There have been pastoral parliamentary committees, there have been pastoral lobbying, there's been a variety of political activity around, as it were, these questions for pastoralists. But it's a question to me how far these have gone. They've been very uh, focused on dialogue, they've been very sort of donor, NGO led. How much has this really engaged with the bigger contentious politics of struggles that pastoralists face, particularly in this, uh, these settings that we've discussed? But that's not to say that pastoralists don't get engaged in political activity. So these are some pictures from the murals in Orgosolo in Highland Sardinia, um, which has been over you know, decades struggle with the state around pastoral issues and many of the uh, murals highlight that and much more indeed. So what does pastoral struggle mean and are there new movements in pastoral areas that are derived from these bigger questions of agrarian change? I think there are but they're not necessarily represented in forms of organized uh, struggle. There are clearly big issues around relationships between pastoralism and the state, um, you know, the troublesome pastoralists on the edge of the state, but there are limited opportunities to mobilize in the context of state-based politics. We, I've talked about the parliamentary committees, but where else is it that pastoralists have a voice? There are some producers' organizations, but they tend to be focused on input subsidies and so on. But there are also, perhaps increasingly, in certain parts of the world, more militant uh, forms of organizing around uh, forms of agrarian crisis, much as uh, peasants have done over decades uh, and longer. But what does that mean for a pastoral politics? How representative are they? What are the, how are the politics of difference articulated? And so on and so forth. Big questions that I'm afraid I'm going to leave unanswered. So I'm going to conclude now from this very rushed but hopefully useful overview of some of these debates with uh, this final slide just by reflecting on um, my view that these debates in agrarian political economy going back to the classic debates of the 19th and early 20th century um, are as relevant as they were then and perhaps more so given the extension of capitalism into pastoral areas 
and the change that change in configuration of land and capital and labor that we talked about and that unlike that tradition of um, the colonial anthropology if you like we need to think about class we need to think about class and gender and age and social differences as they intersect in pastoral areas otherwise we're just not going to be able to understand how change happens and that a basic critical agrarian economy asking Bernstein's four questions using the broad method that Marx advocated way back can allow us if we think hard and I think the literature is waiting for new contributions in this area if we think hard about what difference does pastoralism mobility livestock rangelands mean for thinking about agrarian political economy we can think uh, in useful ways about what this might imply for thinking about the future of pastoralism not as a homogeneous egalitarian tribal based system but one that is um, differentiated with different patterns of accumulation with new politics that creates a dynamic which if we don't um, think about that in relation to development we're going to make big mistakes as people have done in the past.